Council, each side will have 15 minutes to present their arguments, and uh, the appellant may reserve up to five minutes. Please just keep me informed, and I will uh, try to watch time for everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. you may proceed. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, Chris O'Connell here on behalf of the appellants, Patrick and Mary Jo Lavelle. Um, I'm please the court to to explain why we're here. Um, the reason why we're here is uh, quite simple, actually. It's because the trial court was wrong. Um, how is the trial court wrong? Uh, the first issue is that the trial court focused on the issue of unconscionability when that issue was never raised before it. The issue that was clearly raised before the trial court was the issue of public policy. Did the loser pay provision within the arbitration clause violate public policy, as opposed to whether or not it was unconscionable. Despite that fact, um, the trial court went into a rather detailed um, analysis of unconscionability and what's required. Um, that argument was never put forward by my clients. Um, this court has recognized the distinction, as have virtually every court that I'm aware of, have recognized the distinction between an argument based on unconscionability and an argument based on public policy. Um, this well, court, if that's the case, then don't we just send it back for the trial court to address it in the proper manner? That if, if that's what the court chooses to do, that's, yeah, I, I'm not here to tell the court, you know, what it will do. I'm here to argue what I think was wrong and, and, uh, and suggest some possible remedies. That certainly is, is, is a remedy um, that's available to this court. That obviously would be the most simple remedy. Um, this court has recognized that uh, in the Eagle decision, um, which has been uh, discussed at detail, um, where it said that a, a refusal to enforce a contract on the grounds of public policy may be distinguished from a finding of unconscionability. So the first issue is that the trial court focused on um, unconscionability. The second issue, the second error that the trial court had, why it was wrong, is that it went into a rather detailed analysis of Eagle in the context of what the arbitration rules required. Um, and that was in the context of the loser pay provision. And the reason why the Eagle court did that is because the arbitration clause itself did not, did not have any, it, frankly, it didn't have a loser pay provision in it. It said that it was subject to the NFA arbitration rules the court then had to look to those rules to figure out if there was in fact a loser pay provision within those rules. And what the trial court, or I'm sorry, what the Court of Appeals and Eagle determined was that the arbitration rules were discretionary. Um, so therefore the, the court couldn't find that that loser pay provision was violative of public policy because it was discretionary. In this case, you've got the arbitration clause itself. That's what we were pointing to. We were saying that the arbitration clause itself contains a loser pay provision, and it's a mandatory loser pay provision that awards fees to the prevailing party, which, as we said in the trial court, in our brief in opposition, and in our appellate brief, that violates the Consumer Sales Practices Act. The Consumer Sales Practices Act has two very limited instances in which attorney's fees may be awarded. Uh, the first instance is if the court finds that the supplier, in this, you know, the, the party that's not the consumer, um, have, if there was a knowing violation of the CSPA, fees can be awarded in that case. The other second instance in which fees may be awarded is if the court finds that the consumer brings a claim, uh, essentially a meritless claim in bad faith. Those are the two instances in which the fees may be awarded. And the reason why the legislature has done that is because there's there's an incentive that they want to provide to the consumer that if you bring a good faith claim even if you end up losing you will not be hit and punished with fees this loser paid provision which is in the arbitration clause itself goes exactly the opposite way it just says if you're the if you're the losing party you will be uh, saddled with the fees of the prevailing party so there are those are the two those are the two issues, the most egregious issues as why the trial court's wrong. Now, and what your, and your argument is that that provision in and of itself for loser pay invalidates the whole arbitration procedure. It it does yes. And why do I say that? Instead Be of striking it or 
Correct. Or just not enforcing that provision. Correct. First, I would say is that the appellee, Mr. Henderson, never asked for the court to reform the agreement. Um, there was a motion to stay that was filed by Mr. Henderson. Uh, in that motion to stay, he never uh, requested that the court reform the agreement. There was a brief in opposition that we filed to that motion to stay. My client filed in opposition to the motion to stay, in which we raised these issues as far as what the public policy issues are. In their reply brief, they never um, requested that the court reform it. So you've got a motion to stay, and then you've got a reply brief. That Mr. Henderson never asked for that relief. Did they cite, though, to, and maybe this Hedin case had not been decided at the time that the briefs were? The DeVito filed. case. Hedin is a case that we had cited to. That was an 8th District opinion from, I believe, 2014, if I'm not mistaken. That dealt with a similar circumstance, which dealt with an arbitration clause itself that had a loser's pay provision within it. The 8th District Court of Appeals found that that provision itself violated public policy. Uh, they then, the 8th District then decided to strike it entirely. They didn't reform it. The DeVito case that Mr. Henderson um, raises with the Court of Appeals, that didn't change the Hedin ruling that the arbitration clause violated public policy. What that changed was the relief that was afforded by the court, or that could be afforded by the court. In response to that, what I would say is that, number one, Mr. Henderson waived that argument. He never raised an argument that the, the arbitration clause should be reformed. Number two, I guess all we have to do is look at what the Ninth District has done previously when faced with a decision where you've got an arbitration clause that's either unconscionable or violates the public policy, you can look at the case of Eagle that was in front of this Ninth District Court of Appeals, and the Ninth District Court of Appeals, even knowing that they, that the court cited to the provision of the revised code, 1302, that gave them the ability to, to reform. They had the ability to reform, but Eagle decided, no, we're not going to reform. They said that when it's violative of public policy, we cannot and, and it will not be enforced. They just struck it entirely. I would point the court to the new code decision by the Ninth District Court of Appeals, in which, they, in which the Court of Appeals simply said, when you fail to raise this issue as far as reformation at the trial court level, it's not before us right now. I would argue that that is the, the, the framework that it has to be looked at. However, even if the court were deemed that that's not, that argument isn't waived, I would argue that what the Court of Appeals has done, the Ninth District Court of Appeals has done, is they've looked at what's the intent of the parties and the, the, as far as reformation. The intent of the parties is, resides in the language that the parties use. This, this agreement, the, the agreement between Mr. Henderson and my clients, doesn't have a severability clause. If you look at the Ninth District opinions in which there was reformation, particularly um, the Bosich opinion, which we cite to, and the Bozeville opinion, which we cite to, the court made specific findings that there was a severability clause within the agreement, and they went ahead and therefore um, were able to do that. Basically, in Eagle... But I want to ask you, okay, yes. going back to Judge Moore's question, maybe I'm putting words in her mouth, but I thought I read this in, in your brief. Obviously, you rely heavily on Hadeen, which... Well, we do. We do. I don't blame you. No, no, wait. Right. But you, that was the case you cited to the lower court as well. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yes, we do. Because that was a two, uh, this was a 2015 Hadeen had already been decided. Correct. That's what we just wanted to make sure. Yes. I we, thought you'd said that, but I couldn't remember. We you had read a lot, and then you might get confused. Yes, we had cited to Hadeen because, again, Hadeen was, in my opinion, directly on point in the sense that you have an arbitration clause, which the clause itself contains the loser pay provision, and the Court of Appeals said that violates public policy because it runs counter to the remedial purposes of the Consumer Sales Practices Act. And because it runs, uh, because it violates public policy, we're going to strike it entirely. Now you have the later DeVito case, which comes out in... 2015, 2016, or maybe this summer, I, I believe, so, well, 2015. With the DeVito case, it did not change the holding in Hedin as, as it relates to whether or not the clause itself violated public policy. That still stands, and I would argue, even without Hedin, we have solid, we have arguments that can be made that it violates public policy. What DeVito did is it changed 
the remedy that is provided by the court. DeVito basically stood for the, stands for the proposition that when you have a clause that violates public policy, it should be reformed and not stricken in its entirety. I obviously disagree with that, and what I would point to in support of that disagreement is the case law that comes out of the Ninth District, particularly Eagle, which struck it entirely, even though, the, even though that there was a severability clause, the court in this Ninth District in Eagle said it cannot and it will not be enforced. I would also point to the simple, well, not simple, but the basic argument, which is Mr. Henderson never asked that it be reformed, so he's waived that argument. The third thing I would say is that there is no severability clause. So even if the court found that he hadn't waived it, and he can argue that now, there's no severability clause in the agreement. And based on Ninth District precedent, particularly the Bosage case and the, and, the, and the Bozville case, there has to be a severability clause in order for there to be some type of reformation. Um, the other, the, 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 the final things that I would want to address before I reserve some time are the false arguments that are raised by Mr. Henderson. Number one, particularly the, the argument that DeVito um, requires a finding of unconscionability before a clause can be stricken from the agreement. That's not what the DeVito, in paragraph 37, it says a court may refuse to enforce if it violates public policy, period. It's, it's saying public policy. If it violates public policy, the court can refuse to enforce it. And the second one is the claims for, again, if, I would also point the court to paragraphs 36 and 30, through 37 in paragraph 41 where it talks about a public poli where it talks about public policy being a distinct reason not to enforce. Public policy and unconscionability are not one and the same. Finally, I would wrap up with what I feel are hopefully fairly basic issues, which is the standard of review. The standard of review, as I've as 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 the as the Lavelles have argued, is de novo. Why is it de novo? It's de novo because the issue before this court is a question of law. Public policy, like other issues of law, such as unconscionability, is an issue of law. When the court is faced with an issue of law, even in the context of a motion to, to, st to stay, compel arbitration, uh, is reviewed de novo. And the court only needs to look to Eagle uh, at 157, in which Eagle was dealing with the issue of unconscionability, but that was cited to by the Lavelles for the, for not for the, the issue of unconscionability, it was cited to by the Lavelles because that was an issue of law. Um, and so that's the standard of review. Uh, the other thing which I, I've said already is that, again, public policy is a distinct and separate issue from unconscionability. Uh, again, Eagle, the court need look no further than Eagle, and with the focus being with public policy, not particularly on the, the individual parties themselves, but on society as a whole. I would argue that if a supplier can draft and can have the consumer sign an arbitration clause, or any clause for that matter, which runs directly counter to the Consumer Sales Practices Act, and if that can be enforced, that is clearly injurious to the public. That is, the General Assembly has established a framework in which they have afforded certain protections to consumers. Why have they done that? So that there is an incentive for consumers to bring claims. Why do they want there to be an incentive? To deter bad actions by suppliers. If a trial court is just simply going to let that pass, and this isn't a gray area. This isn't something that, this isn't something where the, the CSPA says, well, you can't have an unconscionable provision, and so the issue is, okay, what's unconscionable? This is an issue of the Consumer Sales Practices Act says X, and the arbitration clause says Y. That's black and white. That's an issue that clearly violates public policy, and there's a reason why the General Assembly wants it to have, to have certain incentives for the consumer. With that, I would reserve whatever balance of time I have left, maybe three minutes or so, I believe. But thank you very Not much for your time. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you reserve whatever, right? Yes, sorry. <laughs> thank you, Your Honor. May it please the Court, Mark Young here on behalf of Apoli, Robert Henderson doing business as Renewed Homes. And I have with me my newly admitted bar colleague, Robert Giuliano. Congratulations. Thank you. Four critical and fundamental issues, Your Honor, require upholding the trial court's decision to arbitrate the pending dispute between the parties. 
After that, I'll address some of the statements made by, by the opposing counsel, my colleague, Mr. O'Connell. First, the standard of review. The standard of review in this issue in deciding the trial court's decision to compel arbitration is abuse of discretion. To satisfy this elevated level, an appellant must establish that the Summit County, Summit County Trial Court displayed unreasonable, arbitrary, or unconscionable <coughs> attitude in its decision. Because the trial court relied on relevant, supportive case law, its decision to compel arbitration, appellants failed to satisfy this elevated procedural hurdle. As you heard just very recently with Mr. O'Connell advocating for a de novo standard review, I'll address that at this time, Your Honors. <coughs> the standard of review is, is not de novo because the issue raised by appellants does not involve the interpretation of a contract, nor does it involve a determination whether a fee-shifting provision has conflicting languages with certain provisions of the Ohio Consumer Sales Practices Act. Uh, we are past that kind of basic rudimentary analyses because as a general rule, those are answered in the affirmative. What we are left with here in this case, Your Honors, is the sole issue of how do we address and resolve an issue where there's a conflict with an issue compelling arbitration. So it's a little bit different. It's more advanced than just determining the basic levels of contract interpretation or public policy. Because we're removed from that and more advanced to that, the trial court properly resolved the issue by compelling arbitration. And based on that, that makes the standard of review abuse of discretion as opposed to a de novo review. So, so I want to make sure I understand this. Um, the trial court's actual decision to determine that this matter is not against public policy, which I'm not sure it made that decision really, right? Because it determined that it was not unconscionable. That's correct. But let's say it made the decision that it was not against public policy, and that's part of the unconscionability framework or whatever. You're saying that that is an abuse of discretion and not the decision, and the decision that that's not de novo, and the decision to compel arbitration then would also be an abuse of discretion. In other words, you're saying both of them are an abuse of discretion, or are you saying that all you really look at is whether the ultimate decision to compel arbitration is an abuse of discretion? Absolutely, Your Honor, it's the second. Uh, okay. the, it's almost a two-step analysis. So the first analysis... I didn't ask that question well, so I apologize. No, no, no I, I completely understand what you're saying, Your Honor. So the first step is, and I think at a basic level, and the case law has been very advanced since the 2004 Eagle case, even the 2014 Adine case, getting into 2015. The issue of contract interpretation, public policy, and unconscionability gets you the same result. There's a conflict. And what we're dealing with is a higher level of scrutiny and analysis is now that we have the conflict, how do we deal with that? Do we completely strike the provision as the appellant's request? Uh, we would disagree with that. We would say the 2015 case of DeVito strikes the perfect remedy because if you remove that fee shifting provision as it applies to consumer claims, it's, not, it's neither unconscionable nor it deals with public policy. It makes it a, a perfect bargain for result. Except that that's not what was requested below. I'll, I'll, Your Honor, I'll, I will respond to that by saying that the, re the request in the Apolli brief is irresponsible. So, for example, you are correct. The request was to move to arbitration blankly. It didn't differentiate between a point counterpoint. On appeal, my argument is that issue was not waived because it was in response to the Dean case. For example, the uh, appellants rely almost heavily or solely on the Hadeen case, asking for a certain remedy under certain analysis. What the Apolli brief does is say, that was 2014, let's step into 2015 when that Hadeen case was revisited, and there's actually a different remedy, and that's where you get into the analysis of striking the provision. So it wasn't so much that the relief was waived, it's pointing out what the current lay of the land is as of October 2015. When we go back to, as we will review, the motion to um, stay and the memo, um, the memo filed by um, 
your opposition, are we going to find that the, that the focus of uh, that litigation was on whether or not the uh, loser pay attorney fees provision was unconscionable? Is that the focus of what was presented? I'm not talking about what the trial court determined, but what was actually argued was it the loser pay attorney fees provision and whether or not that could stand as against the Consumer Sales Practice, sales practice Act? Sure, Your Honor. The argument that the appellant put forth focuses on the loser pay provision, how it violates public policy. It talks about chilling speech, uh, preventing consumers from advocating their claims. Uh, so there's not a per se request for unconscionability to, to answer your question directly. Uh, I believe what the trial court did in this July order was to look not only at that but other aspects of violating public policy, whether unconscionability, uh, other aspects that give you the same result. Uh, but to answer your direct question, I do not believe that the appellants raised that issue, even though they, in the totality, they asked for invalidity completely of the arbitration. And, and if we look at that discrete request for the court to consider whether or not the loser pay attorney fees provision was, we'll say, inappropriate, uh, isn't that something that uh, this court would review de novo as opposed to for an abuse of discretion? I would advocate that's, that's not correct, Your Honor. I would, I would still advocate it's an abuse of discretion. How is that? Sure. The, the issue is, again, as, as I related, how do these two coexist? So it's not step one whether there's a violation because unconscionability yields the same result. It's a violation. It's a uh, violation of public policy. So if you exchange one for the other, the end result is still correct. I don't want to speak for the trial court. I'm just giving you my uh, interpretation of the trial. So it's my position the trial court got to the correct answer based on a different principle that's related. Uh, so I still say that's an abuse of discretion because you're looking at whether that result was just, whether it was arbitrary, uh, whether the whole policy should be stricken, or whether it can be balanced. Thank you. Absolutely. And I ask you the same question I asked the appellant. So why shouldn't we just send it back to the trial court to make a determination on whether it's violent of a uh, sure, Your Honor. I, I believe that we are beyond that analysis. So uh, I think it's a, a basic view that it is violative, and the question is how do we move forward from there? And I think the trial court took that step by compelling arbitration. For example, if, if, if there was, say, a stay and there was not an ultimate decision, and it was a point-counterpoint, I would agree with, with your suggestion, perhaps we send it back down to flush those issues out. But because it was flushed out, and an order was issued to stay and compel, I think that's what heightens the level of scrutiny. Thank you. So, so I just want to make sure and follow up to mm -hmm. Judge Crump. So you're conceding that the provision is violative of public policy? That's correct. And the question is, what do we do with it? And once you're saying that the DeVito case gives instruction on what to do as a result of that? That's correct, Your Honor. So for, for instance, Going one step forward, if the case was sent down and let's say there was an express determination that it was against public policy, that does not advance the ball. That doesn't put us in any better position we're in today. So you are correct. My position is now that we have this conflict, how do we move forward and address it? And our position is we go to arbitration and there's a different remedy that the court can, can emphasize, especially in the DeVito case. In particular, the court has the ability to strike the language but what the appellee and I would ask this court to go actually one step forward, and I'll explain what I mean. As you look at the trend in limiting and ensuring there's a balance, so we started out with the Eagle case, we started out with the Hadeen case cited by uh, my opposition, you have a complete invalidity of the arbitration provision. In DeVito, you have more of a tailored approach where you can still uphold and balance the rights of the parties to arbitrate by striking a provision that, that is almost the, the cancer or heart of the conflict. I would ask this court to go one step forward. At this stage, there are four affirmative claims by the appellant, no claim by my client yet, but as you can see in the complaint, 
there's an assertion that the plaintiffs or appellants didn't pay their full amount. So with the myriad of claims that will be there, it's my position, and I would ask this court to invalidate, if they would, the cost shifting provision as to the consumer claims only, rather than chill all recovery of law, common law, statutory, otherwise, for my client. The other issue I'd like to focus on, too, with that request, Your Honor, is in essence, appellants seek to bootstrap the limited applicability of one provision of Ohio's Consumer Sales Practices Act to unilaterally and systematically eradicate my client, the appellee's contractual right to not only arbitrate, but his contractual ability to recover fees under any theory of law, consumer or otherwise. I would ask the court to, to strike a balance and that balance our request is through the DeVito case. I think that's a perfect mirror and analogy into what we have before the court. In particular, striking and tailoring any language that appears to conflict with the appellant's consumer rights, while also ensuring there's an ability for my client to receive attorney's fees should there be non-consumer issues where they prevail. The only thing in between you seem to be asking it seems to be things that the trial court does. It, it could be things that what the trial court said to arbitrate. So it, arguably it could be, Your Honor, there could be some overlap there. Uh, but I think once you look at the actual award of compelling arbitration, then you deal with how is that arbitration going to function? How is it going to proceed? Where are going to be parameters of that arbitration? And I believe that sounds with this court. Well, I understand what you're arguing, and I'm sure we have a lot of power that we don't necessarily always exercise to. But, um, I'm not sure that I've ever seen anything in our prior case law that we've ever exercised that type of uh, discretion in regard to how to handle arbitration and so forth. But we've sent it back to the trial court uh, with instructions to relook at a matter and maybe to uh, instruct the trial court to do something like that. Okay. Sure. I'm just sure. I'm just throwing out here. Sure. I'm just trying to figure out how how we should respond to that. What you're saying may be reasonable. I'm just trying to see how you effectuate that, that's all. Absolutely, Your Honor, and I would ask that this court exercise that discretion for, for the simple fact that at this stage we're dealing with the balance of rights. Uh, sending the case back to the trial court to almost uh, start, whether from scratch or from a point prior in time, doesn't advance the ball. I think, it, as I uh, pointed out to some of the, the justice questions, we are beyond that analysis of a basic de novo. We are, how do we proceed? How do we evaluate under what term? So I would advocate that this court exercise tailored approach. And for, for those reasons, Your Honor, I would ask that the court give deference to the lower trial and affirm the case compelling the parties to arbitration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you for your presentation. You have just about that. I will beat it. Um, regarding the standard of review, again, I would point this court to the Eagle decision, um, and specifically that dealt with an issue of law, whether a, a, an arbitration clause was unconscionable. The Court of Appeals, this Court of Appeals, found that even in that, in that context, even with a motion to stay, compel arbitration, the standard of review was de novo. It was not an abuse of discretion. Regarding the fact that the defendant, Mr. Henderson, concedes the clause violates the public policy, I would direct this court to the following paragraphs of the Eagle decision. Paragraph 62, 63, 68, 73, and 74. In paragraph 68, this court says, when an arbitration clause vanquishes the remedial purpose of a statute by imposing arbitration costs and preventing actions from being brought by consumers, the arbitration clause should be held unenforceable. Uh, this court continues and says, uh, the arbitration clause as drafted clearly invades the policy considerations of the CSPA. Such a contract clause is injurious to the interests of the state. Counsel, is, I'm sorry, you're out of time. Sorry. It's all right. That last quote was from paragraph 74. Thank you, thank and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you to both sides for uh, good arguments presented to the court. The court will take the matter under advisement and will uh, issue a written opinion that will be sent to both sides as well as um, what we place on our website. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.